Hello, Arizona uh, wildcard. Uh, my name is Andy Levy. I am a trial lawyer in Baltimore, Maryland, and I teach Maryland has two law schools, uh, University of Maryland and the University of Baltimore, and I alternate semesters uh, between them. Susan, you're, you're on you're mute, Sue. I apologize. You'd think I could learn. Uh, I'm Susan Arnett. I'm a criminal defense attorney, uh, just retired from the public defender's office in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I teach at the William S. Richardson School of Law at UH. Good uh, afternoon, students. My name is Anthony Miller. I am an alumni of the program myself, so I uh, was in your shoes in my senior year of high uh, high school. And I, uh, after that, became one of the coordinators in the state of Nevada. So I've been helping to organize the competition, coach students and teachers and help them prepare um, for the last 10 years. And this year I stepped down as a coordinator. So this is my first year as a judge at the national competition. And I'm really, really excited and looking forward to hearing what you have for us today. So thanks for being here. So tell us who you are, please, and introduce your teacher. Hello, I'm Candace Takuna. My name is Samantha Lugo. Hello, I'm Jillian Kahn, and our teacher is Brianna Willits. Well, congratulations on being here. Where, uh, where's your high school located? We're right outside of downtown Phoenix, about like 20, 30 minutes away. So we're in Chandler, Arizona. Okay, okay I have a family in Glendale, so. Um, okay, so we're gonna um, do, uh, this is unit four, and you know the question, it's question two, but I'm gonna read it anyway. Mm. Uh, and then once I finish, you're welcome to start it with your opening statement whenever you want. Members of Congress are not only legislators, but they are also inquisitorial and should meet frequently to inspect the conduct of the public officers. That's a quote attributed to George Mason. How effectively do you believe Congress has used its investigatory power? Explain the differences, if any, between Congress's power to investigate and the power of oversight. Which power, in your opinion, is more significant? How effectively do you believe Congress has used its oversight powers? James Madison declared, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, you must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Congress exercises its investigatory power wisely to conduct oversight, check other branches, and make better policy decisions. Significant investigations uncover malfeasance, like the Teapot Dome scandal or Watergate, exposing Secretary of Interior Albert Hall and President Nixon, respectively, of conspiracy, bribery, and obstruction of justice. Some investigations result in charging an official for misconduct, as the House has the power of impeachment, according to Article 1, Section too. Congress also probed into the technological issues. In 2018, Mark Zuckerberg testified over Cambridge Analytica, shining light on the mishandling of user data. Thus, investigations indirectly safeguard privacy and protect the common good. However, hearings in the 1950s blacklisted citizens for un-American activities, ruining lives in the name of security. In Watkins v. United States, the court ruled the House of Un-American Activities Committee overstepped its authority and the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment thus invalidated Watkins' conviction for contempt. So Congress must confine itself to legislative purposes and avoid the pride of private affair of citizens. In the case Kilborn v. Thompson, the court limited the scope of investigations, establishing the Kilborn test to check if the House can compel testimony. In 1924, McGrain v. Daughtery concurred that the power of Congress to conduct investigations is inherent to the legislative process. Founders like James Wilson believed that Congress must have the power to investigate. Article 1, Section 1 implies Congress can conduct inquiry and oversight. Oversight is a prerequisite and enabler of investigation. Neither power is more significant. The Legislative Reorganization Acts of 1946 and 1970 explain that such commi committees maintain continuous watchfulness of agencies, and the House is permitted to review and study the administration and execution of laws. Also, the House Clause 2B1 of Rule 10 mandates that committees shall review and study on a continuing basis the application, administration, and 
execution of all laws within its legislative jurisdiction so that such oversight can lead to further investigation if necessary. And the most recent impeachments of Trump, Congress utilized the oversight and investigatory powers when acquitting him. Locke's second treaties describes the legislature as the most powerful branch, yet Federalist 51 states its, its authority is limited. Such inherent and implied legislative powers represent the people whilst ensuring a check on governmental abuse. Congress has utilized its powers effectively when overseeing federal agencies, as seen with the reports called Consolidation Act of 2000, which mandates that the House, the offices of Inspector General recognize and disclose the most severe management and performance concerns within the agencies. However, due to hyper-partisanship, the legislature has underutilized oversight of the executive. Article 1, Section 9 allows Congress the power of the purse, yet the underuse of oversight allowed one, one political party's dominance in both the executive and legislative branches to pass the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, slashing the highest corporate income tax rate from 35 to 21%, taking the US rate below the norm. Congress uses its oversight powers to effectively uphold the principle of checks on the governmental institution, but lacks bipartisanship efficacy. Congress's power of oversight investigations ensure that the American people have the ability to uncover greed, corruption, and wrongdoing in our country. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. Um, let me sort of let me sort of take off where you left off that it's got the, the power and the potential to uh, do the things that uh, Jillian just cataloged. On the other hand, I think we probably would all agree that Congress's uh, reach has often exceeded its grasp in that department. So I guess tell me the sort of that where you think the system has worked at its best, an example of that, or where it's worked at, at its worst, and sort of what lessons we can draw from that. A great example of when it's worked at its worst is in 1947, uh, when we were kind of probing into American citizens' uh, lives, saying like, "Are you a communist?" A communist, and when we went specifically into uh, the the um, the movie stars, we uh, we brought them in to testify before Congress, and specifically, ten of them uh, refused under the Fifth Amendment. They pleaded the Fifth to answer, "Have they ever been associated with the Communist Party?" And as a result, we held them in contempt of the Congress. So, oftentimes, although many argue that the investigatory powers are beneficial towards the American public, sometimes we go too far and we invade private life and oftentimes harm citizens. So, is there anything we can? So are there any lessons we can learn from that structurally or otherwise to try to stop that from happening again? Absolutely. As we mentioned in our paper, the Kilburn test involves Congress questioning itself. Uh, are our investigations and our, when we summon people to testify, is that going to directly benefit the legislative process? And as a result, we ensured that the further investigations and new investigations um, I ha actually have a purpose um, because those communist investigations didn't have a legislative person purpose. They're not going to benefit any new legislative making, any legislative passing. But there still is that question. Is Congress abusing this power? And quite frankly, there is no yes or no answer. Article 1, Section 2 establishes that the Senate has the power to confirm any nominations made by the executive. Um, recently, last um, in the last presidency, Donald Trump nominated Scott Pruitt, yet Scott for the head of environmental agency. Yet Scott Pruitt in stated that he does not believe in climate change. Therefore, we can see this instance as the Senate underusing underusing its congressional oversight power. Furthermore, going back to what my uh, colleague Jillian said, the Kilbourne test says that um, the. Uh, legislation or the um, authorization of the inquiry must uh, cite a congressional interest to uh, investigate and that if the legis if there is no legislation that can be produced then the private affairs of citizens is not a target of inquiry furthermore going back to the original question a good example of this investigation power is 
let's go back to the local level. In here in Arizona, a Maricopa County judge said that the legislature has the power to investigate and examine election reform matters. Of course, with this past presidential election, it was very controversial and that election um, and ballot systems had to be uh, had to be investigated to ensure um, the integrity of our election system and thus an, uh, protecting the common good. That example on the federal level we used our investigation powers is after the 2005 Katrina hurricane. And we saw a huge disaster uh, in our disaster program FEMA. And so in the interest of Congress and in the interest of public good, we called in FEMA say, hey, what, what went wrong? Because it's Congress's power and it's their legislative purpose to ensure the common good. Thank you. Following up on, on that, um, I'm, I'm thinking about hearings over the years back in what the 50s where they looked at um, game shows on TV and whether there was fraud on the public and how they were being um, uh, presented. Um, in the 60s, they brought the tobacco company heads in to talk about the dangers of cigarettes and what was known to the companies. In the 70s, it was baseball and the use of steroids. Um, do you see those types of investigatory hearings, which may inform the public of something, but are they, do they directly benefit a legislative purpose in your mind? Absolutely they do. Uh, most prominently those tobacco hearings regarding whether or not tobacco is actually harming people or whether or not tobacco should be targeted towards children. Um, and there is a huge spectrum of those investigatory powers um, regarding baseball or regarding the health and safety of the public, uh, of the public good. Um, so, Honestly, there is there is a huge diversity of testimonies, investigations, and how much Congress oversees. Um, but in reality, that investigation power is inherent to ensuring that Congress makes the best laws. That's why whenever you try and buy a cigarette or even vape products, there is that um, that label now that nicotine harms people. Um, and that only resulted after those investigations and after Congress realized that it's important to bring forth those people from the private citizen um, spectrum into the public light to show the problems that those people are affecting the public with. One Further current issue that we see is social media. And um, we can see that the Senate Commerce Committee, um, they subpoenaed the CEO of Twitter and Google, as well as Facebook in order to come forward and seek a, an, a solution to liability protections within their social media platforms. Therefore, we can see that the legislature is actually trying to um, battle these current issues that we have now. Furthermore, the investigations that were conducted in the 20th century also probed into local crime syndicates and the mafia. The mafia had uh, much to do with tobacco. And when it uh, uncovered the wrongdoings of, the, of these uh, crime syndicates, it also uh, provided better legislation to control tobacco use and control these local crime syndicates. So that is also where we can see the great use of investigation. Okay. Um, very briefly, we only have one minute left. I want to ask you further up on that social media and subpoenaing the CEOs of these tech companies. Uh, if you watched any of those hearings, a lot of the questions were kind of a struggle because a lot of the congressmen and women didn't really understand the technology itself, right? Um, a lot of the questions were like, how does the internet work is what they boiled down to. Um, so perhaps do you think there are more effective ways that Congress could investigate and inform themselves on those things rather than calling in CEOs of tech companies to ask them relatively mundane questions about technology that I, I didn't necessarily pertain to the actual issue of the usage of social media. How else could Congress effectively do that it, briefly? So a great use of um, that is lobbyists. Lobbyists are great instruments for congressmen um, as they are supposed to, congressmen um, don't have the time or energy to know every single issue, um, but lobbyists, reliable lo lobbyists, um, know the um, issues cold, the uh, issue A and issue B. So that's where lobbyists can come in and uh, educate um, the representatives. That's an awesome point. I know it's time, but if anyone else has another way that they can effectively do that, very, very briefly, just I'd like to hear it. 
instead of calling in CEOs, it's um, more nonpartisan, less biased lobbyists, uh, because CEOs, as we saw Mark Zuckerberg, when he answered those questions, a lot of his answers were, I don't know. So instead of calling in CEOs or those figureheads, rather call in experts that can explain complex topics with a very simple manner. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a great answer. Thank you very much. Here. So, um, so let me get let me get started. I know that um, Anthony uh, will um, I, I feel safe in predicting will be very uh, intrigued by the uh, the tech um, uh, aspect of your answers. Um, I liked your opening uh, statement a lot. It was um, it was very learned. The, the, you cited a, a, a number of cases uh, that I I don't believe we've heard um, all of them. I mean, um, particularly the, the Kilbourne test, I don't believe if someone has cited it, um, maybe, but I don't remember them sort of using it as a, as, as a reference. Um, the, uh, the government reorganizations that, I mean, that's drilling down pretty deep into the weeds in terms of um, a, a topic like this lock second treatise. I'm, Sure, we have no one else has drawn that that parallel. Um, um, Scott Pruitt, uh, there was a, there was much much to like about both your opening and your and your statements. Um, um, the uh, I, I was just a couple. It, it was you drew a lot of very interesting parallels. I must say, I've, we, I wish we'd had more time to say the least. Um, and, but I mean, I, I never had sort of drawn uh, a parallel between the organ, uh, mafia and uh, tobacco. I think of other substances when I think of uh, uh, organized crime, but uh, and I'm not doubting it, uh, but uh, it's just an interesting uh, lens. Um, and your sort of, it's very, it was what was actually the most impressive thing in a way was, it was in terms of your New, your understanding that you know lobbyist is often used as a pejorative term, and you seem to recognize um, that there are. And I like that you know, well, reliable lobbyists are all right, and I think that would be. Uh, there's a, I think that the, there's maybe a little bit of a problem in figuring out who a reliable lobbyist is. <laughs> I mean, they are. There, there's a there's an old expression never try to persuade someone who's being paid not to be persuaded. So, um, but, and, and, and I, um, and I do, th so, so that's all great. Um, um, I thought that um, your answers were too long, which is it didn't give us, there were any, 12 minutes is not gonna be enough time under any circumstances, but, um, but you should work on making your, your answers a little more um, tailored and efficient because it will allow us to, because um, I have no doubt that no matter what we had asked you, you'd have, you'd have had interesting and informed answers, but you never really got a chance to demonstrate that. You, you were able to demonstrate sort of the depth of your knowledge, but, um, but not, the, not the breadth. So I think you shortchange yourself there and just as a matter of sort of we the people uh, tactics, if you will, that's something always to keep in mind. And then I, I do think just the, the parallel between Congress's confirmation power versus their oversight power, I, I'm going to need, I would need that explained to me more because I think that those are, for the most part, apples and oranges from a constitutional um, standpoint, but it may be that you, if we had more time, you'd be able to um, connect the um, the dots to me. I'm just curious, what year um, in high school are you in? Are you seniors? Okay. Yes. Um, I thought you might be. Um, all right. Well, I, any event, um, great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really, I really wish we had and I have a million things I'd like to ask you and talk to you about. So that's a sign of a very good, uh, very good uh, presentation. I'll just really briefly, um, I also, I, I agree with what Andy had to say. I, I enjoyed your initial presentation. Um, 
the uh, I, I like that quote from Madison. You're not the first to use it, but I like where you put it, and that you then built upon that. Um, I liked when you gave us um, the responses to the questions. You listened to the questions and you answered the questions, and then you built upon the answers. So you went to um, from tobacco to social media, and then you talked about social media. Hey, it's not just a matter of having the CEOs in, and, and I'm sure that uh, Anthony's going to talk more about that. But um, I thought that the point about the 20th century investigation of the crime syndicates, I think you're the first ones who've mentioned that. Um, so very nice job. You can see the work that you've put into this and your teacher. Um, so congratulations to her as well. Um, but thank you. It was informative. Yeah. Um I, I just, wow, overall, you know, we were coming towards the end of the day. And by this time, I assumed we had heard just about all of the examples we were going to hear. And we were going to hear some of the same ones again and again. But you proved me wrong multiple times on that assumption today. Um, I found myself thinking during the prepared statement, I want a, tr a copy, a transcript of the prepared statement. It is just jam packed with wonderful explanations and wonderful uh, examples. And it really ties them all together and weaves them into a story. And I, I was just really impressed with the way you organized all of that information. Um, and then going into the follow-up, you, you answered all of our questions, very, very responsive answers specifically to what was asked with good supporting evidence, good reasoning, good understanding. And, and I, I just, I was very, very impressed with all of that. I, um, so the reason why the two other judges said, I'm sure Anthony will talk about this is because I worked for Facebook for a year, for about 14 months. Um, and I actually started working there shortly before the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. And I was working there when Mark Zuckerberg was subpoenaed by Congress. Um, and so me and all my coworkers were in the office watching, not doing our jobs at all, watching that that day. And I remember we were all just thinking, this is ridiculous. I, now, now, I ended up leaving the company not too long uh, after I started partially because of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and, and, and what it unveiled. But the information garnered from those hearings was absolutely worthless. Uh, it really was a, a, a grandstand for a bunch of politicians to talk to people, to, to talk to the American people and yell at CEOs so they could look good and get political points. And I, that is why I asked this question about how could they have done this more effectively? And I've asked that question numerous times today, and nobody has given me anywhere near the, the unique and thoughtful answers you gave about talking to lobbyists, to, about instead of talking to CEOs, calling in expert witnesses. Uh, the other thing that I've been really hoping to see all day, and I think we probably would have gotten there if you had a little bit more time, was that we don't have to do all of this in public congressional hearings. The 9-11 commission report was a wonderful, successful investigation that was all done behind closed doors, partially because a huge amount of the information was, was confidential, right? But they published a report at the end. And I think there's lots of effective ways Congress can do this that doesn't involve them just doing it publicly in hearings. And arguably, at least in this example, the public hearings weren't really there for them to garner a lot of information. It was there for them to gain political points, right? Um, and so I, I loved all of that. I think the one piece of... Um, criticism I have uh, is that you you made the argument about Scott Pruitt and the EPA. And you said that the confirmation of Scott Pruitt was a underutilization of the oversight power. And the argument you gave for that was because Scott Pruitt was going to be leading the EPA and he doesn't believe in climate change. Now, I fully understand I believe in climate change. And I think it's terrible that we have somebody running the EPA who doesn't believe in climate change. But I don't think that is an adequate argument if your point is that this was an underutilization of the oversight power. Now you can say it was a bad decision, you disagree with it for political reasons or scientific reasons or whatever, but the fact is that there is a political movement in our country who denies climate change. And we have to combat with that. And they are elected into our legislation. They have representatives in Congress who have constituents who believe that and want that. So I just thought that that was a poor argument to make. And perhaps if, if question deeper, you may have had a better argument there, but just, just be careful with that, that the, the evidence you're using and the conclusions you're drawing actually, um, a, a plus B actually equals C there. Does that make sense? Um, other than that one nitpick, everything else you, you guys talked about, I think was wonderful. Your presentation style, the organization, the, the tactical um, 
just things that you guys did with the way that you presented information I thought was excellent. Very, very impressive. You should be very proud of yourselves and your teacher and parents should as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Have a hey. great day. Good luck.